carpenter from New Brunswick whose contract with the community had come to an end was curious to see if he could secure an unusual ride out of town by way of the ice-choked cold waters of the Northwest Passage. Sure, Dave, come along. Dave's saltwater sailing experience, he didn't have any. <laughs> he did tell me he'd been to the beach a couple of times. <laughs> But now there were four of us, and David, being the greenhorn, volunteered to do all the dishwashing. From then on, Joey and I did not mind instant potatoes. We received this ice chart and decided it was good enough. Now, a bit of explanation. Resolute is up here. This is an island, and this is an island. This area here is Peel Sound, the blue representing clear water, the colored uh, portions representing ice of various uh, intensities and coverage. For example, the red is completely solid ice, so you go down to four-tenths coverage with the yellow and so on. We were hoping the wind would develop as forecast and help to move the ice out toward the west, opening up a lead on the east side of the channel. Five miles or so of open water was the hope. We hoped that lead, a narrow stretch free from ice, would actually uh, come about as forecast. This ice, remember, is moving at the whim of wind and current. But we did get underway. Our days were tied to the clock, each person standing a watch of three hours during the day and two hours after 10 p.m. Uh, when we were off watch, we did what cleaning was done. We did maintenance, took pictures, read. We wrote in the log books. We wrote in our journals. In addition to drying his socks, Joey wrote over 600 pages during the trip. He's some sailor, too. He's been to Antarctica. He's sailed square riggers across the Atlantic. He's a sailmaker. He just got his captain's license, 24 years old. Joey Waits, I think we'll be hearing a lot more from him in years to come. Well, you know how it is at sea. Ribald humor, tales of personal manly feats, body stories of pulchritude. Once in a while, there are complex tales, or complex uh, philosophical discussions. You've read your Melville and O'Brien. Deep talks, like this, about the aesthetic of the color blue. It's not Plato or Kierkegaard, but we were getting pretty tired. Ordinarily, as I said, we stood watches alone. At night, sometimes, it was difficult to stay awake. There was a lot of time for quiet contemplation, standing on deck out in the cold. Except for mealtime, most days were spent in relative solitude. There just wasn't that much time together. What with the cold, the chance of danger, the fatigue and being out of feminine, feminine company for two months, it was not a pleasure trip. It was tough. I don't think climbing Everest has ever been called fun until it was over. Sailing Fiona on the Northwest Passage was not fun either. When we got into thicker ice in Peel Sound, we started standing watches with two people. It did cut down on sleep, but made for a safer operation, having two pairs of eyes on the lookout all the time. One afternoon, Joey and I awoke to the sound of ice brushing Fiona's hull. Going on deck, we found Eric and Dave negotiating very thick pack ice in very thick fog. The wind had changed, contrary to the forecast, and was pushing more ice into our lead. We turned around to go back north to clear the ice, only to find that it had already moved in tight behind us. All four of us then came became very busy. Joe and Dave went to the bow to occasionally push ice out of the way with long poles. Eric took up a position working the radar. I was at the helm. We were constantly jigging and turning, speeding up, slowing down, sometime reversing. We forgot about anything else. Even logbook entries were skipped. We may have gotten hungry, but there was no thought for food. We were task saturated, just keeping Fiona clear of ice and trying to make as much southerly progress as possible. 
We had moved further south, leaving Resolute. The sun had begun to set for several hours every night. This night it was so cloudy and foggy that after sunset it actually got dark, something that hadn't happened the whole trip here in the land of the midnight sun. All day and into the night we worked Fiona through the ice and cold, none of us leaving our posts. Around 9 o'clock, those of us constantly on deck noticed we kept passing the same distinctive ice flow. It's a big monolithic hunk. Eric, the skipper, remember, was popping up and down from his radar screen down below. So he wasn't able to keep a constant visual picture in his mind. And Fiona didn't have a chart plotter to help him. Eric was trying to keep track of leads by the scope, by the radar, leads which often closed up or were never leads at all, but just false radar returns. Eric had the mindset we were working our way ever south, when in fact we'd begun to just mill around the same area. Around 11 PM, by the time we had passed that big monolithic hunk of ice seven times, we began to realize that more work was a waste of time. With Eric doubting the outcome, but giving permission nonetheless, Joey lassoed that big hunk of ice that we'd begun to call old number seven, and we tied up for the night, exhausted, spent. We ate around midnight and fell into our racks. Very early the next morning, we awakened with a bump and crunch, the boat pitching up and listing to starboard. Another flow had crashed into old number seven and pressed in under Fiona's hull. A little bit startling out of a sound sleep, but it was fairly easy to cast off the lasso, start the engine and motor back into clearer water. Later, I found out that Eric had sent a message to his website that Fiona had been hit by a berg and tipped over. <laughs> the next night, I got a message from my sister, the people back home are you know, a little bit concerned, tipped over, capsized. I explained to her to pass on that we were fine, it was just a case of the old bump and grind, we weren't sunk. Eric and I saw that experience through different eyes. With his responsibilities, of course, Eric would be more worried than I was. That may have been why he'd use, a more, he'd use more dramatic phrasing that I might employ. Here is old number seven. We had been tucked in uh, over here when another other ice flow came and impressed into us. We were beset, stuck for about three days. Some good questions surfaced during this ponderous time. While I'd had hints all the way from Greenland, the, this question formed suddenly and uh, begged an answer. Why is each person on this boat right now having a different trip, a different experience? This was where I kind of started going to the inner reaches of the Northwest Passage. What was it other than worry that might cause two people to perceive situations quite differently? Now, Einstein once asked the question, is the universe a friendly place? I rephrased it. Do you consider the world to be a safe place? Some time ago, I decided to offload the nightly TV cargo of bad news and start looking at the world as a nurturing place, a generally safe place. I've come to believe that about 95% of the time, the universe somehow takes care of us, no matter how bumbling, fumbling, and ill-prepared we might be. We're going to be OK no matter what. You remember Laylock's famous quote, God takes care of drunks and fools. And I think the universe does require that we pay our due, however. It's that last 5% that we need to prepare for, to train for, because that 5% portion can get pretty dicey. But if we do that, really prepare for that 5%, just covering the margin, then we should be OK. We'll be safe, not 95% of the time, but maybe 99.999% of the time. The world is a safe place, and by working smart, we can make it safer. That philosophy has done wonders for my equanimity, thinking that the world is not out to get me. The sea is not angry. It is just the sea, and preparing as best I can for whatever the endeavor might be. That philosophy has given me solace here as I approach my autumn years. In one place, I, I saw this slideshow promoted. Uh, they called me a pilot, sailor, and adventurer. Now, I am not an adventurer. As Betsy said, I think I'm just a regular guy who sometimes shows up to do things. When I do show up, I try to prepare. I like what Ernest Shackleton said. Adventure is just bad planning. <laughs> Using his definition, I don't think you want old Captain Roberts here sitting on the beak of your airliner to be an adventurer. 
While my thoughts wandered, Fiona remained stuck in ice. There were always small patches of water around, but never enough in which to make headway. We noticed that pack ice drifts at different speeds depending upon the size of the pieces. Fiona itself was drifting three knots to the north back over the hard-earned miles. We were moving a little faster than most of the ice pieces. Everything moving at different speeds like this made it a kind of Arctic bumper boats. Finally, somebody on the boat had the brilliant idea of using the dinghy's three-pound anchor to hook into one of the bigger flows. This made a great sea anchor and slowed our drift to less than one knot. We swung around to the lee side of the flow, the side away from the wind. This greatly reduced the number of ice chunks banging into us. On day two of the big drift, the sun came out, the fog cleared, and shore was in view about a mile away. It was warm, too, about 45 degrees. There wasn't much to do, so we were able to relax and take it pretty easy. We called the Canadian Coast Guard, given them a position report and a status update. They said if we wound up sinking, they'd send a helicopter. <laughs> Having uh, lassoed an ice flow, Joey decided to uh, do some ice wrangling. Dave, meanwhile, uh, decided to remember the night of old number seven with some commemorative clothing. <laughs> if we were crushed and sunk, we were going to work our way to shore. We'd wait there for the Coast Guard. I didn't have a whole lot of concern about a successful rescue if that became the day's action plan. I began to hear a creaking and rigging, a creaking and pinging in the stainless steel rigging. But then I noticed it sounded like it was below the boat not aloft. It wasn't the rigging. It was beluga whales making their living far below the boat, down in the cold water, using their sonar and signals to hunt. While there were these moments of wonder, Eric remained racked with worry. So was Sprague Theobald, also stuck in ice on the motor vessel Bagan, 60 miles south of us. Those two guys owned the threatened boats. Different reality from mine. All I had to do was worry about my own skin. Those two had financial responsibilities, emotional concerns. They had the responsibility of keeping their crew safe. Something that I live with in the air, the responsibility of command. On Fiona, though, that rested with another captain, Eric, not me. You know, being a captain is not easy. With everything else, one must be mindful of plots by the crew. <laughs> Joey, David, and I didn't want to go to all the trouble of watching Fiona get crushed and sunk work our way through the pack ice, drag our stuff ashore, and call for a rescue only to be eaten by a polar bear. <laughs> so we basked in the sun with idle time. We all know the evils of that formula, and we cooked up a plan. If we got on shore and a bear began to chase us, we were going to use the blunderbuss. Since we didn't think much of it as a bear weapon, we thought it might be best if we used it to just wing Eric a little bit, shoot him in the leg, and then the three of us could run very fast in the other direction. <laughs> I know, it's an evil thought. But after all, Eric was senior. Actually, shooting the bear with the blunderbuss would be like using a squirt gun. We were going to need some kind of diversion. And Eric was the captain. <laughs> Responsibility of command and all that. Without even asking him, we knew Eric would gladly sacrifice for his crew. I saw a newspaper report later that uh, reported Fiona's crew was plucked from the deck after the sinking boat had been crushed by ice. I was amazed there was another boat on the Northwest Passage called Fiona. Well, that story was, of course, pure fiction. It was really reported, though. It got me to wondering why a shared story can take off in so many different ways and why our individual experiences are so varied. I was thinking maybe it's not so much what we think, but how we form our thoughts that so alters our life's course. Maybe all our experiences are recorded somehow in our minds like snapshots in an album. Recall of those moments may set up patterns or templates for the way we make future choices. 
It occurred to me that it might help to try to stay mentally flexible by not letting my photo album of past experiences unduly influence new thoughts, kind of a yoga class for the brain. Rigid thinking, it seemed to me, could lead to a lack of imagination, which leads to a lack of options. So in the face of all the questions before I left on the trip that sounded a lot, a lot like, are you nuts? I think a desire to keep the brain flexible might be one reason why I chose to uh, take the leap of faith to sail with Eric on Fiona. I don't know, my thoughts were wandering as we drifted. But once in a while, it might uh, just be good to be impulsive and act before a whole lot of thought. Do that and watch what happens to your life. The ice started to thin and we finally got moving. I was up the mast for several hours, uh, pointing out leads to Eric at the helm. In his blog, he reported those first hours underway as a tortuous path through the ice. Once again, a different take. His reality true, mine true as well. He thought torture. I thought glorious. He saw it as a lot of work and worry. I saw it as a passage through a magical labyrinth of ice, ever moving, ever turning, mist drifting over the ice and water. Leaves would close in only to have another lead open up. We were like characters in a Tolkien novel. We lived in our own mythic adventure. We worked in closer to shore and on toward Matty Island, which forms an important ice barrier for Ray Strait. Around sunset, the water began to be more open, less ice, more open, and then the ice simply disappeared behind us. The next evening, we entered the bay at Joa Haven, where Amundsen spent those two winters. Fiona was finally in the place Amundsen called the finest little harbor in the world. But before we dared get lost in any, any historic nostalgia, we had to get the boat ready to head out again. So we topped off uh, the diesel at Joa Haven's rather rudimentary.